Hello, everyone, and welcome to Boston Balling. I'm your host, Gabby Hurlba. I hope you all have had a fantastic couple of weeks. It's been a couple of weeks since I uh, dropped an episode. I just got back from a really nice vacation. It was a great time, beautiful weather. We're into the fall now, so hope everyone's kind of settling in. It's definitely getting a little bit cooler, so um, hope everyone's kind of enjoying their start to the fall, having a good week so far. Um, I'm really excited to have a special guest with me on this episode. He is very talented in the Red Sox minor league system, has kind of worked his way up and is now currently, um, you know, playing in Portland for the Portland Sea Dogs and the Red Sox organization. And Nico Cavadas, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Gabby. How are you? Good. I appreciate you um, hopping on the show with me today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, no problem. So I know we kind of, you know, briefly exchanged messages before, but I'm definitely just curious to kind of find out a little bit about you and your baseball story, kind of how you really got started with uh, with playing baseball. Yeah, it's a funny story. Um, my dad actually had propped me up when I was, you know, too young to hold my own head up and would toss me a little foam ball and, you know, I would do my best at catching it. And then ever since then, it's been a game that I've really loved and enjoyed doing every day yeah that's awesome I feel like it's it's a lot of times you hear that too that it's from a really young age it kind of just becomes something that you kind of just start doing and then fall in love with absolutely absolutely yeah that's awesome and and when you were younger did you find that there were certain kind of positions that you enjoyed playing more than others or did you just really like playing wherever they would put you when you were young yeah, I really, I didn't mind. Uh, I played a lot of outfield actually when I was younger. Um, I pitched a lot when I was younger, but uh, as long as I could get in the box, I was happy. Yeah, now that's awesome. I feel like being versatile when you're younger too is important. Like I know I've talked to people who said, you know, when you're younger, the more positions that you play, the more marketable you're going to be kind of later on when, you know, people are starting to notice you and recruit you for for um, baseball. So I feel like it's important to just be able to know how to play multiple positions. Yeah, absolutely. When I was in high school, my senior year, you know, I played shortstop in center field and then I got to Notre Dame and got onto a summer lifting program and put on, you know, 20 pounds in, in six or seven weeks and they moved me to the corners. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's really awesome. Yeah, it's it's um, definitely always interesting to hear those those type of stories um, happen. But yeah, I know, obviously, baseball is definitely the type of sport where there's there's a lot of levels before you kind of get to that major league um, level. So for you kind of growing up, who were some of the players that you would say you kind of looked up to the most in major league baseball or the players that you watched that you were like, these are the people I want to be? Yeah, for me, it's funny. That was always Kyle Schwarber um, being really? a, awesome. a left-handed bat, kind of stocky, six foot, six one, Midwest guy. He went to IU. Um, I remember I took a, a spring break trip when I was in high school with a couple of my buddies and we went down to IU and we got to watch him and Sam Travis, who was another uh, uh, IU guy. We got to watch them play. And, you know, I grew up a big Cubs fan, so when the Cubs took Schwarber and he was uh, able to help us make that World Series run in 16, it was really cool. So uh, I, I think Schwarber's been someone that I've always really looked up to. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I like him as a player too. Definitely was sad that he didn't come back to the Red Sox this year. Uh, but he, he definitely was a key part to the Red Sox offense when they made that, that run last year, really. So he's, he's definitely a really likable player. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But, yeah. So he was somebody you'd say that you were like, this is this is what I want to be when I kind of get further in my baseball career. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've been drawing comps to Schwarber for a really long time. That's awesome. Um, and how would you feel like you, your kind of baseball experience getting to this point kind of prepared you? So, I mean, I know a lot of players when they go to college, they say, you know, my college program was really good and, and helped me prepare. But what would you say were kind of the biggest things that helped you to really get noticed and get drafted? Um, I just think the the overall development uh, that, that Coach Jarrett had uh, was really, really important for me. Um, I've always been like a bigger, stronger guy. Um, and I remember he got the job after my sophomore year, before my junior year at Notre Dame. And you know, he said, listen, you can 
go out there and, and you can hit 250 with 20 or you can get into the lab with me and, and we could figure it out and, and we can get you up into the 300s with 20 and we can make you a real hitter, not someone who's just trying to do damage, but, you know, someone who, who can really spray the ball to all fields. And I, I think, you know, his ability to, to teach hitting and, and to develop me really helped uh, me get ready for these next couple steps that, you know, have happened early this year. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I feel like when people look back on their experience, sometimes they, they pinpoint coaches like that, that they feel really have made an impact on kind of where they are at this point. You know, there's always those coaches where it's maybe like one or two coaches that you've had along the way that really helped you get to the point that you're at. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't be here without the phenomenal job that him and Rich Wallace did, you know, developing me as a hitter throughout, you know, my junior and senior year. So I'm really thankful for those two. Yeah. Now that's awesome. What, what drew you to that school and that program? Like what made you choose to go there? Yeah, I grew up 10 minutes away from Notre Dame. So it, it was always a dream to go, to go play there. So when I got the opportunity, I knew it was one I just couldn't pass up. That's awesome. Your family was probably happy. <laughs> they were like, well, he's so close to us. Yeah, they were really happy. And, and South Bend can get pretty cold in, in April when we're playing home games. So there were days where, you know, there are 15 people in the stands and eight of them are my family members and they're all bundled up in coats. And <laughs> yeah, it was really special to, to play so close to home. That's awesome. And do, do you have siblings? I do. I have an older sister, a younger brother and a younger sister. That's awesome. So that's probably so cool for them too to kind of see you and your journey and what you're doing. And they're they're probably like my brother is going to be in the major league in majors in the majors one day. And that's really cool. They've been troopers. They've sat through hundreds of you know summer ball games from the time we were growing up. So I'm really lucky to have them and all their support. Yeah, that's so cool. It's always it's always it's always interesting to hear those types of things too. Where because for you in particular, your family was probably able to go to a lot of your games when you were in college, you know, but I feel like not everybody has that experience because they mm -hmm. go to college farther away. So it must've been cool for you to just be able to see your family there for a lot of the games. Yeah, absolutely. And, and my, my parents actually would travel a lot. They wanted to see all of the fields in the ACC. So even when I wasn't playing 10 minutes away, they made an effort and that meant a lot to me. See, that's awesome. That, that's so nice. Having that family support, I feel like elevates people too. just in general, knowing, you know, your family is there and they believe in you and what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. I feel like that's huge. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's awesome. No. Um, and so, yeah, I know for you, you know, you've obviously been having a really, really good career so far within the organization what would you say are some of the biggest challenges that kind of come with constantly having to prove yourself every day to get to where you are at right now and constantly looking to move up? Yeah, um, this is an emotional game. Um, it's a frustrating game. Uh, it's a challenging game. So, you know, dealing with those emotions and those challenges day in and day out can get really tough, especially over the span of a 140 games. Um you know, you're not going to have it every day. You know, there are days where you're going to show up to the park and you're going to have to compete to the best of your abilities with your C stuff or maybe your B minus stuff. And, you know, finding a way to, to scrap one or two quality at bats out when, you know, you don't necessarily have your A swing. I think that's a tool that I, I've been beginning to develop this year. And I think it served me really well. Yeah, because you're always, I mean, even just watching baseball games. I mean, obviously, I watch so many baseball games in general. Just players make mistakes, you know, obviously. And and if you don't have a good game, I can imagine that's pretty hard to, like, emotionally to be able to bounce back from that in the next game and be like, okay, tomorrow's a new day. Yeah, especially when you, you know, you string consecutive bad days together and you know there comes a point where you know you got to put your foot in the ground and you know it's going to happen to everyone you can't freak out you, you can't get overly emotional it's just part of the game you got to stick to the process and you know develop a routine that works for you and when things start to go poorly you can always you know rely on your preparation and on your routine yeah and I mean, like you said, it's a it's a it's a it's a long game and a long season too. Every game games could last a really long time. You know, it's it's it can be tough. Or if games go extra innings and they're taking a long time, you have to really be able to stay focused. And you know, obviously, I think back at because I'm a huge Red Sox fan, so I'm thinking back to games like that 2018 World Series. 
um, game that was 18 innings. And it's like, how do players stay focused for that long? Because that's such a long game, but you have to because it's still the same game. Yeah, absolutely. Whether you're in the box or on defense or whether, you, you know, you're sitting on the bench, there's so much vital information that's being shared with each pitch. Like you can't check out and check back in. Like you've got to stay locked in. So, you know, whether it's a seven inning double header or whether it's an 18 inning world series game, like you've got to be locked in from pitch one until the final out. And that's part of what makes this game so fun. Yeah, no, that definitely is fun. I mean, how do you, how do players kind of stay focused if it's, like a blowout. Like if the game is like a 10 to one game and it's like the fifth inning, how do players kind of keep themselves from like not being engaged in the game anymore and kind of just losing some focus because they're like, Oh, this game is, is a blowout. A, a lot of it's pride. Uh, you know, you, although the scoreboard may be pretty lopsided, like there's always a chance to compete against the game and to compete against yourself. So just knowing that, you know, nothing less than your maximum effort is going to be tolerated is exactly the sort of culture that, you know, we set in the dugout. And because of that, it doesn't matter if we're up 10 to one or we're down 10 to one, everyone has each other's back and everyone's going to give, you know, everything they have. We work way too hard in the off season just to, to throw at bats away, just to throw defensive plays away because the scoreboard's not close. So, you know, we're always going to give it everything we have because of how hard we work. Yeah, it has to be like that because what's the point of even playing if you're not going to do that, you know? Absolutely. If you're not going to have that attitude going into the game and just the entire process throughout the whole game. Yep, you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then speaking of the offseason, you just mentioned the offseason. What does kind of that typically look like in terms of a workout routine to kind of maintain what you have to make sure that you're ready going into the season? Yeah, um, you know there there is a a point where you need to start ramping up and getting ready for the for the following season. But a big part of the off off season is just you know letting your body recover. Uh, there are so many aches and pains and nicks and knacks that your body goes through during you know 140 game season, and this is my first time doing it. So you know I may not be the perfect guy to ask, but you know for me in the off season with all the people I've reached out to, you know when do you pick up a bat? When do you pick up a weight? You know, a lot of people have recommended take your time. You know, it's a long off season. You've got a couple weeks, you know, maybe start your lifting schedule, start your running schedule pretty early. But I was, you know, advised not to even pick up a bat until after Thanksgiving and not to pick up a ball until after Thanksgiving and just give your body some time to recover. Cause like I said, it's such a long season. If you tried to jump out and go right into it, you know, the wear and tear, you're going to be, susceptible yeah that makes sense because you know obviously with injuries and things like that you want to make sure that you're taking care of your body because the last thing you would want is to go into the season and not even be able to play because you you were too you know intense on your body in the off season and too hard on it to the point where you can't even start the season because you're you have an injury of some sort yeah, and as difficult as this game is physically, it's every bit as difficult mentally, if not more so. So, you know, giving yourself that that time just to wind down and decompress and, you know, let things fall and then and then, you know, a couple weeks go by and you can pick it back up. I think that that mental break is every bit as important. Yeah, no, for sure. That's a really good point, too, because I feel like sometimes people underestimate the mental part of it too because it there very much is and this just kind of goes for life in general too I feel like everybody kind of needs a mental break from what they're doing and just their their lives and you know their job regardless of what that is and we all kind of need to take those breaks sometimes and kind of decompress from what's going on and I feel like some people just don't do that enough and it just can really really get tiring mentally and that's just going to affect no matter what you're doing. And especially if you're playing a sport, it really, really, I feel like can be exhausting if you're not mentally taking a step back and being like, okay, let's, let's chill for a little and do something that's relaxing for me and not going, you know, 100 all the time. For sure. For sure. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. I mean, even at the major league level, I'm sure they don't, they take some time too. I'm sure they don't start to really pick up a bat again until some time has passed after the season ends, because if they go deep into the playoffs, they definitely need some time because obviously, like you said, it's a long season and spring training starts 
pretty early on in the year too. So by the time, if, if they're a team that goes all the way to the world series, then they're looking at their season really not being over until November. So then that doesn't give them that much time. So it really definitely is important. I feel like to at least take some time to just kind of step away from everything and just enjoy herself and just do things that you can kind of decompress and get ready for the following season. Absolutely. I know, you know, something else that I've always kind of wondered about is players do have, you know, times where, they might get traded to another organization if there is, you know, at the major league level, a trade and they're including some of their top prospects in that trade from their minor league system. That's got to be hard for players. Like how would people really deal with like, you know, if you're playing with somebody every day and then all of a sudden in the middle of the season, you're finding out that they're going to a different organization. Like how do people handle that? Yeah, it's funny. You should ask. Um, We were just in, you know, Somerset last week and one of my best friends, Nick Northcutt was, you know, the mm-hmm. player to be named later. And I think the Tommy Pham trade. So he's yes. headed back home to Cincinnati. And it was such an interesting dynamic because, you know, we're up playing cards the night before. And, you know, the next day uh, he's in the locker room asking me to leave him a ticket because, you know, he's not going to be in the dugout and, you know, he's got a flight the next morning. So, you know, you develop these relationships with these guys that, you know, are going to be brothers for life. And, you know, at, with the blink of an eye, they could be, you know, shipped off to another organization. So it's a really difficult part of the job. Yeah. That's kind of sad to think about because it's like you spend so much time and put so much work into that organization. And then if you find out that you're going somewhere else, you, you know, you have to hope you have a, that sa- a similar experience and that you're able to kind of grow and thrive in that new organization that you in. Cause there, ha- there has to be an adjustment period. Yeah. And and additionally, you spend so much time developing these relationships that you do with all of your teammates and with all of your coaches. So to, you know, pick up and have to go do that from square one again, it's really, really difficult. So, you know, we're praying for Cody. Yeah. No, I hopefully he hopefully he uh, finds success for sure, because obviously when the Tommy Pham trade was announced, everybody was wondering who it was going to be that was going to be going. Um, And so obviously it was literally just announced but it's it's got to be hard on a player because you know you're so used to playing with this team and then you're you're used to kind of that area that you're living in during the season and you have to go get acclimated completely to somewhere new while the season is still going on that's what has to be hard yep yep it's a crazy profession (laughs) Yeah, yeah i really i can't even i can't even imagine that but um for you looking at the organization that you're in being part of you know the Red Sox organization, such a historic franchise and just, you know, obviously one of the best fan bases in baseball, which is totally unbiased, even though I'm a Red Sox fan. Um, are, is there some excitement that comes with that for you that like you possibly could get to that point where you're playing games at Fenway Park in front of, you know, Boston fans? Like, is that is that exciting for you? Yeah, absolutely. It's exciting. And, you know, it's something that you know, I'm 23 years old and I'm still going to bed thinking about every night, you know, is that's the goal and that's the end goal. And that's why we do what we do. But in order to get there, you know, there are steps that have to be taken. So it's, it's what can I control today uh, in an attempt to, you know, make that an outcome tomorrow. So being where your feet are and doing everything you can before you go to bed at night every day, is, I think the, the proper way to attack that. Yeah, because, I mean, obviously, we all know how historic Fenway Park is. And I know people, you know, when they play at Fenway for the first time, it probably is such a cool experience just because of the history that's there and just the history of the franchise in general and the success that they've had, especially, you know, recently in the 2000s. And so I feel like it's just a good organization to be a part of. And I hope that that's something that, you know, is exciting for you because you are definitely well on your way to being there. Yeah, and Fenway in itself is so cool, just the stadium. So, you know, my sophomore year in college, I got to go take a couple rounds of BP out there. And I remember just, you know, stepping into the dugouts and onto the grass and signing pesky pole and, you know, just thinking, you know, this is where Big Poppy was not so long ago. And, you know, it just gave me goosebumps. It's such a cool place. And to think that that could be my future home, I'm, I'm really, really blessed. Yeah, honestly, though, I mean – I, I'm, I obviously, as as you can tell, I love the Red Sox, but um, so how often do you really get to interact with 
people at other levels of the organization. So like, I mean, people that are in AAA or work at the AAA level or even at the major league level, is that something that you get to do a whole lot of is interact with people at those levels or is it mainly just kind of interacting with people that play with you directly or work at the level that you're at? Yeah, I think that's the really cool thing about spring training is they kind of throw all of the players and all of the coaches together and, you know, we, we get acquainted and, and we learn from one another and then, you know, we'll, we'll separate as we head to our affiliates. But during spring training, you get a feel for, you know, with each level's coaching and players and, you know, their overall culture is like. And I think that that was really cool for me. That must be so cool. So you got to kind of directly interact with Alex Cora and people like that in the Red Sox organization who obviously are at the level that you strive to be at eventually. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so cool. I know. I mean, my, my favorite current player, I don't know who, what's going to happen with him after this season, but my current, my favorite current player on the Red Sox team right now is Xander Bogarts. Was he somebody that you've gotten to interact with? Yeah, it was cool. You know, we're out getting at bats in the backfields during spring training and you know here he comes on a cart and he takes an at bat on our field and then you know turns around and takes an at bat on that field and comes right back and takes an at bat on our field and hops back on a golf cart and heads out and you know that's the luxury of being a big leaguer and all of us in the dugout you know see that and and that's our goal and that's just another reason we want to strive for that that's so funny <laughs> that's so cool he was just living the life out there doing his doing his Xander thing yeah because you look at somebody like that who has spent so much time in the Red Sox organization and has had so much success with this team and so he is loved by so many Red Sox fans and you know obviously we, we're curious as to what's going to happen with him because he's going to be a free agent but that's somebody who you look at and is like, that could be me one day who maybe could spend a lot of my career here. And I feel like being in the system and trying to work your way up to that just has to be exciting to look at somebody like that, who you, you know, has loved playing in Boston and has found a lot of success here. Yeah. And, and like, it's really cool being at the double A level. Cause like Trevor story came down and rehabbed a couple weeks ago and, you know, to see him in the way he acts on a game day in the locker room and, you know, I went up and I kind of just sat in the cages and I was a fly on the wall during his pregame routine one day. And, and to watch, you know, the level of detail that he carries out all of his pregame routines with, it was it was really cool to watch. And, you know, you start to pluck little things from there. But at the same time, you don't want to ask him too many questions because he's got a game to get ready for. So it was it was a really cool dynamic having him in the clubhouse. And he was an awesome guy. And we were really lucky to have him for the couple of days he was down here. Really? Yeah, he seems like a really good guy. And obviously, I was super excited in the offseason when they signed him and they brought him to Boston, because I think personality wise, he's obviously somebody who has been in the game for a while, had, you know, a lot of success prior to coming here. And I think that's somebody that you want on your team. And so for you being able to interact with those guys, because like you said, a lot of times when they're rehabbing, they do go to double A and they play games with with those players. So from your standpoint, it probably is cool to be able to just watch somebody like that who's actively doing what you're trying to do at that level and be like, wow, this is somebody I want to be. Yeah, it was really cool. It was really, really cool. Um, another thing that I know is sometimes talked about is that players don't always stick with the same position that they are drafted into I know particularly that happens with you know shortstops or just middle infielders in general but um like how often would you say that realistically happens in terms of you get drafted to an organization and you're playing for a certain position is would you say that's more often than not that by the time somebody gets to the level that they're trying to be at that they're playing a different position or is it kind of more common for people to stay in the same position they're drafted into yeah, I think the game is just kind of trending in that direction where, you know, there are so many games and there are so many different potential lineups that you could create given your set of players that if you can play multiple positions and you can be versatile, then there are multiple ways for, you know, the manager to fit you in that lineup and to play matchups and that sort of thing. So I think that, you know, the game's trending in a direction where the more positions you can play, the more often you're going to play and the more valuable you're going to be to your team. 
Yeah, that's what it seems like because now we, I mean, I know this past draft, the Red Sox drafted a lot of shortstops and people were like, why are we drafting so many shortstops? And I'm like, because they're not all going to be shortstops for like permanently when they're in the organization, they're going to be able to find other places for them to play. And I feel like that could go for anybody. I feel like they always say that shortstops are versatile and can play multiple positions, but I feel like that could apply for anybody. If you get drafted, if you can play multiple positions, it's just more likely for you to be able to maneuver your your way up to where you want to be because they can be like, Oh, I can throw this person here or here. Like somebody like Kike who -hmm. can play multiple positions and he's kind of here to you know, be able to step into different positions. And obviously primarily has been playing the outfield this year, but, you know, last year he was kind of used as that utility person that could kind of play wherever. And so I feel like you're right. I feel like baseball now is kind of like that. It's they're looking for people who, oh yeah, I can play this position well and this position well. So when they do draft you, they're like, we don't necessarily have to rely on this person playing this one position. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing about that is it kind of breaks up the monotony of, you know, going out and playing 160 games in the same spot. It's got to be kind of fun for a guy like Kike to play, you know, shortstop one day and then second and then third and then outfield and back to second. I think that would be really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. So being one of those types of people who's like, oh, yeah, like I get to play third base today, but then tomorrow I'm going to play, you know, left field, just as an example. Like that must be just fun for people because – like you said, that it's a long season. And if, if you play the same position every day, obviously, if that's your position, that's your position. But if you are the person who has that flexibility of being able to move around, it probably just makes things more interesting. For sure. Um. So when you're playing games and you're facing a pitcher that you know is really, really tough, do you have a different approach at the plate than you do versus somebody who – hasn't had that good of a season um, and, you know, you might hit better against or is the approach always the same when you're stepping into the batter's box? Yeah, the approach is always the same. Um, this game is is hard enough, regardless of, you know, who's on the mound. So I, I think if, if you're going to change your approach based off of like the numbers that a pitcher has coming into a given day I, I think that it could be a really tough season for you I think that you need to treat every at bat like it's your last at bat you need to treat every pitcher like they're Cy Young and prepare for the at bat uh in that way or else you know you don't want to give at bats away you don't want to be at the point in the season that we're at right now and turn around and say you know I wish I had those five at bats back I wish I would have taken those 10 at bats more seriously so I think that that's why you know every at bat needs to be approached the same way yeah and I mean every pitcher is going to have bad games and every pitcher is going to have good games, regardless of what their numbers overall look like in a season. I mean, cause what if that happens to be the game where they have, you know, just a really good game, they throw maybe a, almost a no hitter or they're just spot on that day. Every pitcher is going to have games like that. Even if going into a game, people are like, Oh, this pitcher isn't good. Like he hasn't had a good season, but the more people who think like that, <laughs> Well, that the more likely it's going to be rough for them if that person is having their best game of the season that day. Yeah, this is baseball. Any given team can win on any given day. So you can't take anyone lightly. Yeah, no, that's 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 really interesting to think about, too, because it's it's so interesting. I That's why I always say to people, you know, a team could drop a series against a team that is not that good and, you know, maybe lose two of three in a series against a team who you just should have, should have beaten, but maybe that team just had a really good series that weekend or whatever, whenever that series was, it's just so hard to predict or know, Oh, because of this team's record, we are going to win that series because why else would you play then? If you don't know, if if you think you know what's going to happen, you know, and and any team at any time could come out and just play a better game And so I feel like that's why people can't – the minute people start thinking, like, oh, we should be able to win this game, the more it's going to backfire, I feel like. Which is – that's what the fun thing is about baseball, though, because you never really know with how long of a season is it is who's going to go on hot streaks when, who's going to go into a slump when, and who's going to, you know, win games. It's just – it's it's that's just the fun of it, and that's why it's such a long season. But – when you when you go when the team in general goes through a slump, 
like if your team like maybe loses a few games in a row and is struggling and just can't seem to kind of find their groove for a little bit, because I feel like that does happen with how long of a season it is. How do you guys as a whole kind of bounce back from that to try to kind of get back into it? Because I can imagine that could be a little bit tough mentally if the team things just don't seem to be going right for consecutive games at a time and you're just, you know, maybe you have lost like six out of seven games or something like that. I'm just making that up. But Yeah, um, I think, you know, regardless of the outcomes of the games, like as the Boston Red Sox, we're going to do two things, you know, we're we're going to outwork you and we're going to have a good time doing it. So whether you've won 10 in a row or, you know, where you've lost a couple in a row, like when you show up to the field and you walk through those double doors, like there's a job that needs to get done. So we're going to show up and and we're going to outwork you and and we're going to have a good time enjoying one another's company while we do. Hey, that's a good attitude to have because what else are you supposed to do really? You know, but um, yeah, it's, it's, I feel like it definitely can can sometimes be tough because I've always wondered that just from watching games, even at the major league level, when I see the Red Sox drop, you know, maybe six games in a row or something like that. And I'm like, how do the players, you know, come back from this? Like, how are they able to mentally be like, you know, we we can still win games like this is just kind of a bad time for us, a slump, you know, and obviously this season for the. Red Sox was not great, but, you know, again, there were just multiple things that went on with that, but being able to bounce back after those, those types of situations can't be the easiest thing. No, it's not easy, but at the same time, you you can't freak out and, and change your entire routine because, you know, today didn't go the way you wanted it to, or because this week didn't go the way you wanted it to. Like if you're a part of this organization, it's because you've been doing the right things for a long time. So just, you know, trust in that and and trust in one another. And, you know, your team's going to find a way to to turn it around. Yeah, that's why baseball, I I feel like it's cool in terms of it really is so team oriented. You rely so much on each other to kind of get through things. It's such a long season. You you are playing so much with these guys and it's just everybody needs to kind of rally behind each other. And that's something that I feel like when people talk about kind of that clubhouse feel of a baseball team, I feel like that's so important is being able to have that good culture in the clubhouse and have that momentum of being able to kind of, you know, rally behind each other and be like, we, we are a team, like we have a job to do and we're going to do this. And I feel like some teams are better at that than others. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, there are three things that bring a team together and that's time spent together. That's shared adversity together and that's having a common goal and you know each affiliate in each major league organization is going to share those things so you know that's just a testament to you know how close each and every affiliate is and how close each team is yeah and I, I feel like that whole you know the whole idea is when somebody gets called up to the next level and you're so close with your team. Like, for example, if you were to get a call, um, you know, tomorrow, I'm going to that you're going up to AAA. Obviously, you're probably going to miss those guys that you played with, but they're probably super excited for you. The guys that are at that level playing with you, that you're getting that next opportunity to go up and really showcase what you can do at the next level, which is one step down from being in the majors. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love that everyone in this organization has each other's backs and, you know, we're rooting for one another. We're we're one big unit. We are the Boston Red Sox. We're not, you know, hundreds of individual players. And, and I think that that's a really cool top-down culture theme that we have. And I think that's part of what makes this organization so special. It is a special organization. I, I, I definitely agree with you on that. I mean, growing up a Red Sox fan and just kind of seeing everybody who – comes up in the Red Sox system when they do make it to the major league level, just how excited they seem to be to be there and just be a part of that organization, just a storied franchise. I think it just makes for just a good atmosphere in general, just at every level within the organization. And like you said, that whole having each other's backs thing, that's definitely a really, really good mindset and mentality for an organization to have, because you can look back at, the, your time here, like say when you do get called up and you're at the major league level, you're where you want to be. Like you're going to remember these games in the Red Sox organization and be like, wow, like this is such a, a cool place to be playing. Absolutely. For sure. 
Um, yeah, well, I only have a couple more questions for you, but um, what would you say are some of um, your favorite stadiums that you've played in at the double A level? Um, I haven't been to very many stadiums yet. Obviously, Hadlock Field is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I think Reading had a had a really cool environment. They had a you know a little pool built into the fence in in right field, and it was a really cool. historic concourse. I think that was a really cool little area. Um, I hear Hartford's really nice. I've never been. Yeah. Um, so Hartford's Hartford. really close to me. I'm from Connecticut, so I uh, oh, very cool. I go to quite a few yard goats games over there in Hartford. That is a cool stadium. Nice. Yeah. Um, of the ones I've seen, I, I really like. I really like Reading. That's awesome. Well, um, hopefully when you play in Hartford, when we, well, I mean, who knows if you will, because maybe you'll be up in AAA by then. But um, <laughs> if you do play in, in games in Hartford next year, I'll definitely have to go to some of those games. It sounds good. Because um, that, that is a fun stadium for sure. Um, and it's, you know, Connecticut doesn't have a whole lot when it comes to sports teams. So that's kind of what it is there. And so many people go to those games in the summer. So it's definitely a cool environment to go there. Awesome. Um, but and then the other the other one I kind of had was how do you block out the crowd during games? Because I feel like sometimes fans yell a lot during games. And like sometimes when I'm watching a game, even you can hear just those one or two fans that's like screaming from the stands. Like um, even on TV, I'm like, oh, I hear somebody who's yelling like to somebody um, about something. But if you're at the plate or even if you're in the field and maybe you make a fielding error or something and people like get mad from the stands. Like how, what does it take to kind of block that out during games? Yeah. It's funny because I'll sit and I'll watch a game on TV and I'll hear those people too. And the minute you step in between the lines, it's, I just feel like I don't hear anything. I I hear my teammates and my coaches and that's about all, Um, you know, you're so focused on the task that you have at hand that the last thing on your mind is, an irrelevant fan's opinion, uh, to be yeah. quite honest. So <laughs> when, when you're locked in and you're going, they could be screaming anything they want. It's their blinders up. Even though fans think that what they say is going to upset a player so much. And I'm always like, do you think that they care what you who's watching the game and not in their position is thinking about this play that they're making? It's like, why don't you go do that then if, if you could do it better than them? Yeah. And you know, sometimes you hear it occasionally in the dugout, but when you're in the box or when you're on deck or when you're in the field, like you're so focused on whatever it is that, that you're about to do that the last thing on your mind is whatever they have to say. <laughs> That's so interesting. Cause I've always been, I've always wondered like how hard it actually is to block out the crowd when there's so, if there's so many people at a game and they're all yelling different things, or even like when they're cheering, like, you know, like let's go sea dogs or whoever the team is. Um, like that stuff, like in between innings, if they're cheering something like that, that must be cool to probably hear that type of stuff, like about your team and support of your team. Yeah. You can feel like an overall energy of the crowd, you know, when they, when they're on your side or when they're not on your side, you can feel the overall vibe, but it's difficult to, to hear like distinct voices or distinct things being said. Okay. Yeah. That is more of like, yeah, you know that they're there Mm -hmm. and if they're, happy with how you're playing you can kind of generally sense the energy that the crowd's like yeah. into it and is excited for you but if people like are chanting specific things or like screaming at the top of their lungs about something in particular players just aren't paying attention to that just right over your head yeah that's so interesting <laughs> I've always wondered that because I'm like yeah like what if this person hears that like that's pretty like offensive or mean for fans to say things sometimes that I feel like are a little over the top. And I'm like, do players hear that? Cause if they do, I feel like that can kind of be upsetting. But at the same time, like you said, they're fans. It's not like they're your coach who's telling you to do something differently. Yeah, exactly. That's so interesting. I'm, I really appreciate you answering that for me. Cause I've always <laughs> been curious about that, but um No, I think you're definitely well on your way. I think obviously you're a fantastic player. You're definitely being talked about a lot in terms of a standout in the Red Sox organization right now, somebody who everyone's really excited about um, to, you know, kind of keep maneuvering your way through, hopefully um, getting your opportunity there within the organization 
at that major league level one day is hopefully um, in the near future for you. So definitely really excited for you and kind of your path as you continue through the organization. Awesome, Gabby. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, Everyone, I really appreciate you tuning into this episode. This was fantastic. Really appreciate all the insight that you gave me here. Um, Appreciate everyone listening to the show and tuning in every week. Um, It's always a pleasure. And so I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your week. Um, As always, go Red Sox. That is what what we're here for. That's what we all uh, we love on this show. So um, go Red Sox. And Nico, good luck to you with everything as well. Thanks, Gabby. Go Red Sox. Have a great rest of your day. You too.